Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining today's webinar event. I'm Ian Taylor, uh, this year's president of the CFA Society Ottawa. After a few quieter months, we are ramping up our programming. So please do take a look at the upcoming events in our events calendar and keep track of our social feed. Uh, and a special thanks to those who attended our successful uh, golf tournament uh, a few weeks back. It was a beautiful day and, uh, and we had over 30 participants. So, so that was great. Um, today's event stands to be one of our most well-attended events, period. So forget just webinars, but any event that we've ever really hosted. Uh, at last count, we had 140 participants registered, um, which I think speaks to a few things. Uh, first and foremost, the efforts of the volunteers who have organized the event, uh, who I will uh, introduce shortly. Uh, but paramount to that is the relative importance of the topic. Um, this past week, our treasurer, Kevin Pay, uh, shared the most recent statistics for our membership. The percentage of women in the society remains close to 18%. And now this reflects the broader global statistics. So it's in line with the last numbers I've seen. Um, but it's also despite uh, some very focused efforts by the Institute to increase participation. So quite simply, it hasn't, it hasn't moved uh, for the last number of years, uh, despite those efforts. Um, I did note that some of the candidate statistics were slightly higher, but really not enough to move the dial at the membership level. So as challenging as this data is, I, I know it also remains a significant opportunity. Uh, I know for a fact that there remains significant opportunities that are both lucrative and fulfilling, and that employers are putting greater emphasis, not just on representation, but uh, the true benefits of and real positive impact of uh, you know, diversification in the field and diversity. Uh, but don't ask me. Let's listen to today's speakers. The title of uh, today's event is Inspiring Female Role Models in Finance, how did they get there? Uh, it's a great title, very descriptive, and it's bang on as to what we're going to be going through today. And so I do want to take a big opportunity to say uh, a thanks to our host, Meryl Chikalku, who is the Chair of Women in Investment Management for the CFA Society Ottawa. She's also an investment counselor at RBC Phillips Haggard and North uh, Investment Council. Uh, Meryl's co-host today is Rochelle Breesbaugh, who's the co-chair of Women's uh, Employee uh, Resource Group at RBC Ontario North and East, and also nonprofit commercial account manager at RBC Royal Bank. So please welcome uh, Rochelle and Meryl. Thank you so much, Ian. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have an amazing panel of successful women joining us from Toronto, Boston, and New York. I must say this is the only time I really appreciate virtual events because let's be honest, I don't think we could have landed these exceptional women on our panel in Ottawa had it been an in-person event. Um, now, let me start by introducing our panelists briefly in alphabetical order. Carol Crawford, is joining us today from New York. She is the Managing Director of the Americas Region at the CFA Institute. Degmara Vigilkovsky, she's joining us from Toronto today. She is the Senior Vice President, Senior Portfolio Manager, and Head of Global Fixed Income and Currencies at RBC Global Asset Management. And we have Jasmine Richards. She's the head of diverse manager research at Cambridge Associates in Boston. Now, um, let's welcome our panelists and um, let's get started as uh, we have a tight schedule here today. We have three panelists in only one hour and we wanna leave some room for questions and answers at the end. So um, Degmara, my first question is for you. As the head of global fixed income and currencies, at RBC Global Asset Management and responsible for managing over $200 billion in assets, we want the audience to really understand what do you do? Um, how would you describe your day job as if you were telling a member of your family at Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, thank you, Maral, for the question. Good uh, afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. Uh, how would I describe my job? Let me start from a big picture. Uh, I think about my job as about learning what's happening in the world and just translating it into expectations on asset prices. Being investor in fixed income and currency markets 
uh, you have to be a bit of an economist, a bit of a political scientist, a bit of statistician, game theorist, and not to forget psychologist. I think about my job as putting together a puzzle where the pieces are always changing, new ones are added all the time, and the picture itself is changing. It's fascinating. The day starts by catching up uh, what happened overnight in Asia and Europe, uh, reviewing prices of uh, assets, currencies, rates, stock futures, uh, and commodities. All of them tell me something about the sentiment of the market. I note news reports, those that align with my views and those that don't, those that are new and those that I consider it to just be ripples of what the market had known before, uh, those that I think are tempest in a teapot and should be ignored, and those that I think have the potential to blow into a storm. And I note what I should spend time on investigating deeper. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of information that we get every day that's coming from us at us um, from various sources. Experience in this market teaches us to sort out uh, the trees from the forest uh, and keep emotions at bay. I'm trying to think ahead at what prices uh, I would be interested in buying and at what prices I would be interested in selling. That's the key for me, how the risks correlate and preparing and waiting for the right opportunity in the market and being patient to wait for that opportunity. Preparing the plan and working the plan. Uh, if you have a plan, the market comes to you uh, and you play offense rather than defense. I try to devote my mornings to thinking about markets, learning about markets, and my afternoons to people management. Our team is located in three different cities, in London, UK, uh, in Vancouver, and in Toronto. So I also have to work across time zones. Um, and that... That takes some care to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Thank you so much, Tegemara. I think uh, that was one of the best descriptions I've heard of your job, obviously. So thank you for doing that for our audience today. I think uh, it, it's very neat, and you have to understand. You have to be somewhat expert in all kinds of fields, and that's really, really true. And so thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Dagmar. It's great to hear the variety of what a day in your life looks like. I'm sure it's quite exciting. All right, our next question is over to Jasmine. So Jasmine, your title Head of Diverse Manager Research is unique in itself and it's impressive to see in the investment space. Some of us on the line, myself included, coming from business banking, when I hear diversity, when it comes to investing, I think making sure there's a good balance between fixed income and equities. But I think what you do is more than that. Can you describe to us what it is that you do? No, I, absolutely. First of all, so thanks for the invitation. I actually have a, a very good friend who lives in Ottawa. So if there, it, you know, so I, even if this was in person, there's a good chance I still would have wanted to, to join. So thank you for including me. Um, but Rochelle, I think the way you put it actually is, is a good way to think about it because I think of my role as just continuing the philosophy of why you want a diversified portfolio. And so we know that you always want different asset classes. You want to include different sectors, different regions. Um, and so there's no reason you also wouldn't want different life experiences, different backgrounds, different viewpoints also represented in your portfolio. And unfortunately, just to do to tons of of historical reasons, that's not where the asset management industry currently is. Uh, less than 2% of assets globally, right? So not just in the US, not just in Europe, globally, are run by uh, firms that are owned or led by women or, or people of color. So that's an entire gender, as well as any non-white uh, races or ethnicity. 
which obviously we all can understand is a significant portion of the, the global population. Uh, and so there's a massive opportunity to continue to improve the performance of our portfolios by seeking out people from different backgrounds. And so my role was created here at Cambridge uh, in, in 2018 to continue that work for us to intentionally go out and seek investment in what we consider underrepresented, underdiscovered uh, funds and strategies and include those in our portfolio so that we can continue to improve performance. Uh, so that's pretty much my, my role in a nutshell. I mean, that makes so much sense. The more diverse, the better, right? The more ideas, the more diversity of thought just um, is better for anybody who's out in the investment world. So thank you for that, Jasmine. Can you hear me? I had unmuted. Okay, good. Um, Carol, you have an amazing diverse background within the finance industry. Um, you have an accounting background, have been the CFO of a tech company in the past, have managed family office investments, and have been involved with FinTech and crypto, and now the managing director of the Americas at the CFA Institute. There's so many questions we want to ask you, but we have such little time. Um, let's start with you walking us through your career journey and perhaps elaborate a little bit on fintech and crypto part, as it's a very timely and interesting topic for everyone, for people, yet it's very hard to understand. Uh, I... I... I hear you. It, it is definitely timely and top of mind um, at the at CFA Institute, I'm delighted to say as well. Um, first, of all, I would do want to thank you, Morale and Rochelle, for inviting me today um, to speak. It's, I was so excited and looking forward to this event. And I also, Ian, have heard some amazing things that you, the events that you have had at CFA Ottawa, including a crypto event and an ESG event recently. So I'm delighted to see um, those events happening. And, and I too may have been in Ottawa for the event, given this, that um, Ottawa sits within my region. So, so, but I'm, I'm glad to be that. here. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to be here virtually. Um, I actually, um, as Morale shared, I began my career as an accountant, um, ending up as a CFO for a, a technology company. Um, I had always had an interest in, Wall, in working on Wall Street. So I joined Morgan Stanley during the dot-com era. Um, while I was at Morgan Stanley, one of my clients had a successful ex exit um, and ended up setting up a family office. And if you're not, if you don't know what, or if you're not familiar with family offices, these are entities that people like Terry Matthews in Ottawa or Jeff Bezos in the U.S. set up to manage their tremendous wealth. Um, I ended up starting my own firm, FinCap 360, where I worked with fam a group of families. Um, that wanted to direct invest in startups. They didn't want to be LPs in a venture capital fund. They wanted to direct invest. Um, and if you are familiar with family offices, they have their own minds, if you will. And the only area that the families could agree on was fintech. And so I ended up mastering fintech uh, because that's where the, well, that's that's where the, it, was, it was easier to be honest with you. Um, so. Um, it started with crowdfunding. I actually have been around, if you will, Bitcoin since 2010. Um, and no, I did not invest. Uh, I would not be here. I'd be on an island that I owned. <laughs> um, but, uh, but also alternative data and, and, um, and even looking at, comp at uh, investment firms that used AI or data science in the investment process, which at the time was new and now is becoming pretty um, ordinary, or at least we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, I was very involved in, um, at CFA Society of New York, I served on the board and founded their FinTech Thought Leadership Group. Um, and during the, in that time when I was on the board, I met Mark Franklin, who's uh, CFA Institute's CEO, and we completely hit it off. We were at a dinner um, and, you know, with the board, the executive committee of my board and some of uh, Mark and, and members of her board and, we, board, and we almost went off and had our own little conversation. So um, I was delighted. Uh, I guess about six months ago to hear about the role and and um, and have never looked back. I started on July first. Um, I'm excited about the Americas region and it, and and I think there's tons of opportunity. I'm excited about Canada. I, if, I'm sure you guys know that Mark Franklin is from Canada, and so I when I say the Americas, she makes sure Canada is very <laughs> at the forefront of this discussion. Um, 
but it, but it's a, it's been quite a journey. I, I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm actually glad to be here during this time of transformation. Thank you for that, Carol. Um, I will ask my next question um, from Degmara again. Um, Degmara, given your tenure um, at RBC and, and the fact that over 40 portfolio managers, traders and analysts come to you daily for advice, it's an amazing accomplishment. How, how did you get to where you are now? Um, walk us through your journey and please share with us your biggest challenges you faced with along the way. Uh, thank you. I used to uh, say that I think my path to being a portfolio manager is a bit unconventional. But over the years, I realized uh, as I meet, meet more and more women in asset management that there are no conventional paths. Uh, and here in Carol, you can actually confirm that. Uh, but what I meant is that uh, I uh, am an immigrant to Canada. I came to Canada at 23 by myself. I had an economics degree from Poland. Uh, a little of accounting experience and was trying to figure out how I find my way in this society. And I felt that in order to do that, I need to get a graduate degree in Canada. I needed this educational stamp of approval. Otherwise, it was always no Canadian experience or no Canadian education. Uh, so that's why I did get my MBA from Ivy. Uh, and that helped me get uh, my first job with RBC. And lo and behold, 27 years later, I'm still with RBC, but my job has been changing pretty much every year. So that was a good choice, I'd say. I was hired in a financial management training program in corporate treasury in the bank. Um, I quite quickly figured out that that's not what I want to do. I was migrating towards capital markets and tried to figure out where in this big organization uh, people work in capital markets. Uh, uh, the natural and obvious choice for me was um, DS or uh, capital market sell side. And that's what I thought I would be doing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I couldn't break through. People in capital markets on the sell side are looking for a very specific type of person. Um, I went through all the interviews and I had my, uh, and the feedback I got was actually quite interesting because I heard, yeah, you're smart, you're analytical, but you're not a cowgirl. I was like, not what? You're not a cowgirl. That basically was a um, short way of saying that I wouldn't fit in on the culture of the trading floor. Um, can't talk sports. Not very interested in sporting events. You have to pay me to go to a hockey game. Uh, so I just didn't fit in. And I thought that was actually as much I felt that it was unfair, I took that feedback and tried to figure out what are my strengths. Uh, yes, I'm not a cowgirl and I don't plan to become one, uh, but where would I have would be an advantage. Uh, and I realized that there are areas in capital markets that um, do not require the skills that I lacked. Uh, so not everybody is an extrovert. Not everybody is ag aggressive. Analytical skills, being able to um, actually think things through and work uh, analytically is important. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I wanted to, as I was thinking about these skills, I thought, an introvert. And I'll bring to your attention this book that I think is very helpful as you're trying to figure out your future in any industry. It's written by Susan Kane, 
The title is Quiet, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. I think that book, if I read it at the time, would direct me to the buy site. But in absence of the book, I actually did a lot of talking to people who have been around in capital markets for a while, and I discovered the buy site. I think the buy site has been the secret 25 years ago and still remains a secret. A lot of uh, people who are graduating uh, from different programs in universities, even business programs, are not aware of a career of a portfolio manager. Uh, I think as CFAs, we have uh, our work cut out for us to promote that career, especially for women. And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's why I always say yes to invitations like this one. Thank you so much, Degmara. I loved your specific examples. And I think somehow in today, I don't know how many years later, right? It's still the same, unfortunately. You, you're smart, you're analytical, but you're not a cowgirl, you know, to hear that from an employer or, you know, I think a lot of people in the audience can resonate with you. The fact that, you know, same with me, I, you would have to pay me to go to a hockey game, unfortunately. Um, so I really appreciate that you share those uh, with us. And um, the more people that can resonate with your stories, the better it is. And that is the purpose of this um, event. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Sigmar. I think it is important to hear that you don't have to be a certain way that other people may want you to be to still be clearly quite successful the way you are. So um, next question is over to Jasmine, more on, um, you know, talking about your, your education background there, Degmara, coming in and getting your MBA. So Jasmine, you have a very high educational background. You have both your CFA charter and your Master's of Business Administration. What made you pursue both of those? <laughs> That's it. Uh, so I actually, I started um, with the CFA first and when I was was working on the trading desk and I agree with Dagmara that I think the, the buy side is is somewhat of a secret, right? Like when you think about those, all the people that come and recruit on campus, it's very seldom the, the buy side firm. And so when I was working on the trading desk, I realized that that was a path and probably a better fit. And so I actually started doing the CFA with the, the purpose of building that skill set to allow me to transition because I went to undergrad and I did engineering. Um, and so I felt like there was what I was learning on the job, but there were still a lot of holes and I felt like the, the CFA was going to give me that, that deep sort of background um, in, in financial analysis. And, and while I was doing that, I think there's always in all the, the online forums, you'll see, should I do a CFA? Should I do an MBA? And ultimately I went back to, to business school for a different reason. So I actually enjoyed my job at the time. I had uh, transitioned into a, a research role after finishing level two. Um, but for me, the, the MBA, I think, offered something different. I think it gave me optionality. I think the CFA is, is concentrated and deep. And I was at a point where I felt like I wasn't sure exactly, you know, maybe this is what I want to do now, but maybe not 10 years down the road. And so first, I'm from New York. I went back to New York after, after undergrad, and I felt like my network was very New York focused. And while New York is awesome, um, I didn't want it to be solely New York. And so I wanted to give myself lots of different options, both in my networks, but also in, in my background. So when it, the part of the reason I chose University of Chicago was because you can build your own curriculum, because I felt like I did have that depth from the CFA program and the areas that I wanted to explore, right, like weren't those traditional finance places while I did that. Um, I also wanted to start out, you know, at the beginning and in, in some other areas of, of business. And so I had that flexibility. And so for me, I think the CFA con combined with the MBA now is really helpful for what I'm doing now, where I feel like in some ways I'm this, 
intrapreneur where my team was brand new here at Cambridge Associates when I started. And so in some ways I get to build a business here, but, and so I'm using some of that MBA, but I'm also using a lot of, of the CFA as well um, when we're meeting with fund managers and doing our analysis on, on investments and advising clients. Uh, and so, yeah, so I feel like I wanted to have both. It was probably also very, I think, classic, uh, woman and that I probably was overcompensating. And at the time, I never wanted to be told I couldn't do something because I didn't have X, Y, Z. And thankfully, uh, yeah, there was a, a woman on my desk that told me very early, you know, start the CFA while you, you're relatively young and don't have that many responsibilities. So I'm glad I got it done. No, that's amazing. And, you know, and coming from an engineering background, I think that's pretty special to hear in the audience. And I know when we were prepping with this, Dagmara shared some similar um, advice that you don't have to have that, you know, undergrad in a BCom to still be a very qualified person to do the CFA charter, just given the fact that as long as you can, you know, understand and you grasp and you're curious about complex uh, concepts, it ends up making for, you know, a successful transition over. So that's uh, really neat to hear it. And, you know, these stamps of approval that women sometimes may feel we need to add these layers and letters behind our names. Um, I think it's great that you have them. It's, I, it's too bad when we do feel that way, though, because everyone's incredible and we shouldn't feel like we need to do something to get somewhere, right? All right, so on that, um, going again to the, the why is to Carol as to why you chose to pursue your CFA designation. And what advice would you have for those that are considering to pursue the designation? Well, before I answer the question, I will say, Rochelle, I feel you're getting closer to signing up for, for level one in this process. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting excited. recruited as we speak. <laughs> Um, you know, I will say that I had, I wanted to, to since I started working at, um, I'll call it on Wall Street, I wanted to pursue the designation. Um, I was working, I'll just say, at a large investment, for, investment firm, um, and uh, I told my manager I wanted to get the CFA or sit for the CFA, the level one of the CFA exam. And he told me that I didn't really need the char charter, so he wasn't going to sponsor me, even though the gentleman who was sitting next to me in the bullpen was being sponsored for the exam. Um, so, and then he also told me that he'd never really seen anyone like me be successful in the industry. And so, you know, he wasn't really sure it was gonna make sense uh, to support me in getting the credential. Um, I ultimately did sit for the exam and, and, um, and ha have the credential and it's been incredibly valuable <laughs> for me professionally. Um, and as an FYI, the guy that was sitting next to the, me in the bullpen, he never got the charter, but, um, so, <laughs> uh, but, but he's very successful in his own right. So, but, it, but it's actually, it's, it's, I'm delighted to, 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 it's something that you kind of want, or to me, it was the gold standard. And I just felt like I wanted to have the gold standard. Um, it's, it has made a huge difference. I would say that conversations in the investment community with people you meet and people you work with starts, start assuming that you have the knowledge. No one questions your knowledge base. Um, I even get confessions of people who, you know, who are doing incredibly well, but who, are, who said, you know what, I couldn't get past a certain level two, or I really wanted to sit for the exam, but, you know, I just didn't know if I, I could make it. And it's really, it, I would tell you, that I almost feel like the day I got my charter, my credibility tripled um, in, in the industry. And it, it, so it's just been absolutely amazing. Um, uh, it, I'll say this in terms of, um, I, and also I think part of why it's so important or why it's made, made it a big difference is that the, you have to pass the exam. And I will re remind everyone too, you have, to, you have to pass ethics too, which is on every exam, but you have to pass the exam. And so it doesn't matter who you know, your network, you know, if someone in your family made a contribution, it doesn't matter. It's the ultimate democratization um, in terms of, of knowledge and credibility because you must pass the exam. So um, it, it makes a, I mean, I, like I obviously I highly recommend <laughs> sitting for the exam, um, but it's, it's really made a significant difference for me professionally. Gotcha. And I mean that, you know, someone like you comment that you heard early on in your career, I think there's probably many people on the line who have heard something similar. 
And uh, good for you for pursuing it and doing it and showing the world that someone like you can do it and can rock it. So amazing. And maybe maybe someone like me one day too, who knows? Um, <laughs> so uh, next question is over uh, to Dagmara. So in preparation for this call and getting to know this panel uh, a lot better, Morale and I saw a common theme with all of your responses and about a theme of women at work and them being involved um, with imposter syndrome. So can you describe to the audience what is imposter syndrome and what can employers do today to overcome that and attract more female talent? Uh, absolutely, but before I go over, uh, let me just add that in my case with RBC Global Asset Management, when I first knocked on the door that I would like to work on the buy side, they told me, yeah, you don't have CFA. We don't hire anyone without CFA. So. I was doing it every year after I wrote my uh, exam and I started my job with asset management on the Monday after I wrote level three exam. So they stuck to their guns and I stuck to mine and we found our path together. Uh, with regards to the imposter syndrome, um, I think it's about self-confidence. Uh, Women expect of themselves to know everything on any subject that they are asked to speak of, right? Uh, they often also assume that other people expect them to know everything. Uh, and if they don't, uh, we have panic attacks that we are going to be found out for incompetence. Um, that's particularly damaging and holding women back when it comes to taking on a new job uh, or a promotion, because inevitably, by default, when you're taking on a new job, you're being promoted to another level, you have gaps in knowledge. So it's a very uncomfortable feeling. Um, now, if you think about it rationally, you understand that, but you know, feelings are not always about being rational. Uh, if you think about it rationally, these gaps are good because they give you learning opportunities, growth opportunities. You, and when you're taking on a new job, you have the carte blanche to ask questions. You should be taking advantage of it. Um, as an employer, uh, you ask about what companies could do to, to overcome or help women with this imposter syndrome. I think as an employer, it's important that we realize that, uh, that such fears exist and that we offer support. Mind you, I don't think, I'm not talking here about doing anything special for women in terms of support. I'm just saying we need to make an extra special effort to communicate the existence of the support. The support exists for both men and women, but women, unless they often, not unless, but often if they don't hear about that support, they go going to hesitate about making that step. Uh, I know that uh, from my personal experience, when I was taking a big step in my career, it meant a lot that the person who was offering me the job said to me, I'm going to stand by you and help you out to grow into this role uh, before I retire. Uh, and and they, they were true to their word. He was actually my mentor and my boss. Uh, it's very comforting uh, that you know that your boss has your back. Um, and that's what I try to do for any new employees, men and women, uh, my standard phrase is, I want you to succeed. I'm not wasting time with people who don't have potential to succeed. Uh, but the onus is on new employees, uh, whatever their level of confidence, to ask questions. We can't help when we are not asked. I love that idea. The, the, the ability to level the playing field that there is support for everyone 
and if it's clear enough, then we know this by default, then you'll get that more diverse uh, level of applicants. So great point, Sigmara. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sigmara. Yes, it reminds me of that um, the study that's been that was done on the specific subject where, you know, when there was a job application and when a woman looks at that applica application, they look the job post, they would say, oh, I have 90% of it, but I don't have the other 10%. So maybe I'm not going to apply because we want to be perfect and we want to know everything. Whereas when a man looks at it, and, and I know we are generalizing here, but um, when a man looks at, at it, they say, oh, I've got 60% of it. Great. I'm going to apply for it. <laughs> you know, So um, it is in our nature, but we just have to um, be okay with not being perfect. Right, so thank you for um, touching on that. Um, our next question is for Jasmine. Um, what was the one non-academic thing and that you felt best prepared you to be successful, Jasmine? So I think um, what I got out of completing the CFA most and, and my advice when, when people say, oh, I don't know if I'm going to study for this because it's too hard. The pass rate is, is, is you know, 30%, 40%. I think I saw 20 on like level one this year, which is insane. Um, is that I felt like the, the content of the CFA is, is understandable by anyone, right? Like, I don't think it, it's beyond anyone to pass this exam. I think in addition to you being able, willing to sit down and, and study and put in the, the numerous hundreds of hours, right? Like that we hear quoted every year. I think what really gets you through level one, level two and level three really is that discipline. And that's sort of the intangible thing that I got out of, of studying for the CFA. I think I was, I was fortunate in that, um, you know, a lot of things in, you know, in high school and before, right? Like I was able to, to comprehend and, and absorb pretty quickly, but the CFA is very dense. Um, and it is not a sprint, it is absolutely a marathon. And so what I had to figure out was how to instill that, that studying discipline so that you can survive for six months studying the same content. And you might be really excited about it in January, but what about you know the days that you don't want to show up and you don't want to study? And something, I was in New York uh, where, where Carol was, where I took level one and level two, and something that was really helpful for me was the CFA Society in New York creates study groups for you. And so I was matched with three or four people who I had never met, but we happened to have the same schedules and wanted to meet on the same days. And we stayed together for level one, two, and three. And I, even on the days that I didn't want to study, I knew that we were going to get together on Saturday. And so, and I had, you know, what I wanted to get through and maybe it was that being a woman, but I knew I wanted to show up, right? <laughs> like understanding all the content and being able to get through our sessions on the, on the weekend. And so for me, I think that discipline of, of really sticking to something and not just showing up when it feels good, but, but when it doesn't. Um, because you know where you eventually want to get to was really what I got out of the, the CFA uh, and I think has been, been pretty helpful. Thank you for that, Jasmine. It's true. Um, I think one very common thing across the board for everybody who knows the exams and studied for the discipline, the determination, the hard work, giving up some social life, um, commitment. So if you have all of these things and some understanding of uh, math background, um, we say it's very doable. Yes, it's hard, but it's very doable and um, we're all capable of doing that. So thank you, Jasmine, for sharing that. Um, Carol, um, let's shift our focus on women and investment for a bit. Um, today, about less than one fifth of worldwide CFA charter holders are women. That's uh, less than 20%. We know that it's not because we are less capable. Um, why do you think this number is so low and what is the CFA Institute doing to improve this statistic? You know, uh, Maral, thank you for the question. Um, I think 
part of it is visibility. I think all of us want to see somebody who looks like us succeeding. And when we see that we're inspired and we, we are deter we, we're determined and we know we can, we feel like we can be successful because we've seen someone um, who's like us be successful in the role. So I think that's a huge part of it. And so, but, and as you can imagine, being at CAFA Institute, one of the first things, um, this is something that was top of mind for me. Um, I'm obviously committed to, to um, at bringing more women into the industry and also with the charter. And I think I love what Jasmine, uh, how Jasmine described um, uh, women, female portfolio managers as underdiscovered. Um, that was, I, I love that term. And I think, so I guess what we're trying to do in the Americas regions is discover more candidates. So we're working on an initiative where we partner with organizations, uh, both on the for-profit and the nonprofit side. On the nonprofit side, organizations who part of their commitment or mission, if you will, is to bring women into the investment industry or the financial services industry. So they're already very focused on kind of going out into the to out into the world if you will and identifying and encouraging inspire those inspiring those women to join um, the industry and we want to make sure that cfa institute is presented as a, an amazing alternative or, or amazing amazing path to get into the industry so we haven't kicked off everything i kicked it off the initiative fully but it's something that we're going to roll out this year you may i don't know if you know but we're uh, cfa institute is coming out with a, a DE and I code uh, in the coming months. And I am blown away by how many significant firms have are very interested in adopting the code. What makes the code different this year, or, or this the code different, I think, from other initiatives, is that we're actually asking firms to provide their data. So it's not just, oh, we think we're going to be thoughtful about diversity in the industry. They have to actually provide their data. We don't share their individual data. We're going to share the collective data because we want to see if if um, some of the uh, some aspects of the code are making a difference. Um, but I think it makes it a difference when you are when you're just signing a code versus when signing the code means that you're going to share your data. We've also found with these relationships um, with that a lot of firms are interested in bringing more women into the industry. And we're working on partnerships to either bring women who are still in, in college or even women who are in their, these firms ranks um, to try to compel them to, um, to take the exam, to sit for the exam. So those are, that's just something that we're working on, but it is a major focus. I'll be honest with you, it's part of why I took this role because I thought, I feel like you know, it's an opportunity to, to move the needle for women in the industry um, yeah, to, to answer that. Uh, I had another point. I'm just trying to find it. Um, but anyway, we're 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 excited for it, um, and we're we're going to hopefully report results in terms of how many women came through these channels. Thank you, um, Carol. Yes, um, I'm happy to hear that the institute is keep working on new initiatives like this. We already have women in investment management. Um, at all societies at the high level at the CFA Institute too. And we are doing this event through that, but I'm happy to hear that the diversity and inclusion code is uh, being very well accepted and popular. So I, I look forward to what the uh, results would look like, the data from companies at a high level. Yeah. Um, our um, last, oh. It's okay, Mara, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking over here. Um, our last question is for everyone. Um, what key message do you have for the audience today? I'm, I'm happy to, to start there. I think one of the, the questions that we, we saw come in was, it was around, you know, how, what would be your advice on on being able to to move up, up faster and, and i think the theme through this discussion and and what my advice would be is that i think your your difference is is your power right like when dagmara goes to the trading desk and they say right like you don't fit right like she doesn't fit to a certain group of people but that group is not representative of everyone it's not representative of all clients and so um you know i would i 
think I've evolved on this over time, but I would lean into those areas of, of differences um, because I think that that's, first of all, where you're going to be able to, to add value. It's where you're going to be able to do something that someone else can't do. I think my role right now is a combination of my lived experiences as well as the training that I've gotten in school and, and through my work. But um, part of, of who I am as a person is what allows me to be successful here. And so I would, I would lean into those, those differences. I like it. I like the leaning to your differences as a summary. I was going to, uh, to highlight perhaps few of the qualities that women can take stock of your inventory of your skills and strengths. And sometimes we underappreciate our own skills. So I think investing uh, is a great area for women to thrive. Um, think about positives that are very useful, analytical skins, skills, tendency to do your homework well, <laughs> thinking before acting, planning, list making, all of these are working to your advantage. Now, there are things that work to women's disadvantage, and often women and men, if they exhibit excess caution, unwillingness to be wrong, worrying about what people think, lack of confidence. These are things that we have to overcome to find success in this field. Uh, we can manage these. <laughs> these are difficult to uh, live with in any field of life, you know, unwillingness to be wrong, good luck with that. Uh, so I think taking stock of uh, things that we can lean on, whether these are differences or our strengths, and things that we have to work uh, to overcome uh, is very helpful. Uh, there is a perception that you need to be aggressive to be successful. I think it's wrong. You have to be thorough in your research, patient. And remember, this is an area where results can be measured precisely. Results are objective. Nobody is stupid enough to discriminate against alpha. If you're producing measurable results, you'll find success. Yeah. The other thing is that I think actually buy side is an area of finance that's family friendly. You have much more flexibility than in investment banking. I could choose not to travel when my daughter was very young. We learned through COVID that we don't need to travel at all, <laughs> frankly. But, you know, at that time, it was actually uh, good to be on buy side because I could... Uh, decide whether I am going somewhere or I'm going to interact uh, remotely with people. Importantly, you know, I could leave my job at five o'clock and work in the evening after my daughter went to bed. And there is much more flexibility when you are the client than when you have to bend yourself towards whatever um, project uh, uh, your company is working on right now that's at the discretion of the client. Um, and finally, I think, uh, you know, as I started with talking about my day, it's an ever-changing world and invest being an investor gives you a front row seat to that world and uh, stakes in participation. Uh, I couldn't love more what I do. Uh, so I, I really want to encourage all women to have a look at it as a career. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I'm, I'm going to make two quick points uh, because I do want to leave time for questions. Um, be fearless. Uh, that would be, to me, the, the number one or the best advice that I can give. I don't know if... Um, if any of you have ever seen uh, either a picture or been on Wall Street where they used to have this statue of a little girl, hands on her hip, in front of a bull, at least 50 times her size. And she's the most confident little girl you can imagine. I love that. I mean, and that's how, that, that's how in my mind, you have to kind of approach life, but definitely um, approaching this industry. And, and I think in order to be fearless, 
you have to have a network of people who support you. I think Dagmar shared about her, um, her boss at the time who was committed to supporting her, but you have to build a network of community and people who not only have your back, but who can provide feedback, keep you confident. Um, I, I think to me, CFA Society New York, and I was actually a member of CFA Society Washington at one time, um, and being a member of the society, CFA Society Ottawa, I mean, I, I just having been around morale, I can tell you that it's a, it's a great network of people who are supportive. Um, so I, I think that combination of being fearless, but also having that net, network of support, those two, two things are very important. I, uh, I love that you brought up the fearless girl, Carol. We actually use that with our when within our women's ERG this uh, this throughout our, our campaign that we're doing right now. And I feel like I just read something that they moved her around International Women's Day, and they had all this glass that was broken around her, and how she's breaking glass all over the place. <laughs> Anyways, it's uh, it's a really cool story, and uh, I love that you brought that up. Okay, so we have eight minutes. We do want to be mindful of time, but we want to get in a couple questions here. Um, I know that Jasmine did talk a little bit to, on Kylie's first question about moving up the ladder quicker. Um, so why don't we go to the next one down by, uh, by Gabrielle that says, how can females who are more junior in their careers still support other females within the industry? Um, I, I learn from the, the younger women on my, my team all the, all the time. We actually um, had a discussion this summer about, as we're collecting diversity data from our fund managers and things like that, about um, pronoun usage and how do we adapt our client materials and our, um, our presentation and how we just in our internal research, right, like to be more adaptive. And, and they were far more versed on that than, than I was. Um, and so I would say just because you're younger doesn't mean you, right, like there's tons that you still have to have to offer. And, and so I, again, I would, I would bring your perspective. I'm, you, there's tons of things that I think are changing every day and we can't keep up with, with all of it, especially as you have more responsibility in the office. And so I would, I think offering that perspective, watching for blind sides, uh, blind spots and, and supporting other women. And even in a meeting, just uh, reiterating, if you hear someone getting spoken over, right? Like I do that all the time, right? Like reamplify what someone said. So I think there's, there's tons you can do, even if you are relatively junior on the team. I love that, something so simple. Just re reinforce the point that was made in the meeting. And to your point, your, your full-time career is, you know, talking about keeping things diverse and age, having different ages is another way to be more diverse, right? People think of things and look at things differently. Um, so Jasmine, this is going back to you. There's just two questions around, um, cause you did mention about the discipline and it looks like the audience is asking for some examples of what that actually looked like. Like how many hours a week did you carve out? How did you make sure that you stuck to that schedule that you were so disciplined about? Yes, I would say it, it changes for our group specifically. We met every Saturday at someone's office and I think, um, and we considered it like a normal work day. So I think we met at nine, right? Like, and we went until we finished whatever the study session of that week was. We created exams. We went over materials. Um, again, to the idea of, of diversity and thought, I think the part of the real value was if I didn't understand something that week or if I thought I did understand something that week, we would get to the question and sometimes when you study by yourself, you don't understand why you got something wrong. And there was always someone in the group to say, oh, actually here's how I understand it. Here's what, right? Like, and so to have people to bounce things off of um, was really helpful. But yeah, each Saturday we would get together. I think that week before we, you know, met every day, but we just had like a normal schedule. We mapped it out at the beginning. We would always start like that week after the Super Bowl because the guys always wanted to watch that. But after that, we shut it down. <laughs> after the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the start date. Oh, these sports. All right. Uh, I love that, though. It is just discipline, right? Like slow and steady each, you know, keeping track of it, even when you don't want to do it and just showing up. 
Okay, we'll take one more question before we wrap up. Uh, and I really like this one because I've seen it in even interviews before. But if you could go back to the start of your career and give yourself advice, what would you want it to have done differently? I can start by saying and reinforcing the message that Carol gave at the end. Uh, I would network more. As a natural introvert, I felt very uncomfortable reaching out and um, connecting with people. Uh, I think uh, at times in my career, especially early on, uh, that made me feel lonely. And, and I have learned over time that there are meaningful ways to uh, keep connections with women. Now, in particular, in the age of LinkedIn, uh, it's easier to share uh, interesting articles um, or thoughts. And I think um, that was something that I should have probably done more. Uh, and I'm trying to teach my daughter, for example, how to do that. And so if you could give the audience one, you mentioned LinkedIn, how would you ask, get them to start? Like, what's the easiest way to start? Is it a cold call message to somebody? What, what would you say? Um, I would just start with people that I have genuine connection, people that I know through work, uh, that I've met. It's kind of uh, difficult to reach to people that you have never met uh, and just introduce yourself, um, but uh, less comfortable too. But I, I'm, I would, you know, I just mean talking and maintaining relationships with women that you meet in day-to-day -day life, in CFA events, in um, company events, uh, maintaining contacts with people from school, CFA self-study groups. Yep. I love that. And you know what? Morale is actually really good at that. When we meet, we book the next time we're going to meet because it's yeah. otherwise you, you can lose that connection, right? Yeah. Okay. Like right. reaching out to Degmara. <laughs> yeah. It's like, for instance, reaching out to Degmara. A lot of people probably thought, oh, she's too busy for this. I'm not going to, she's too high up there, too busy. I'm not going to reach out. I decided to test my luck and she was so quick and responded to me right away. And I was, I just know. I've seen her on the panels before too. I know that, and she said, first thing she said was, my heart is, is this subject is so close to my heart. Um, so of course I will do it. And so when you reach out, even if it's a cold reach out, um, if the right person is on the other side, you will get it, right? So there is nothing to lose. So that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, we are on one minute left. So I, we have a few more questions left here, but I think we'll reach out to you to answer your questions in, uh, separately. Um, I wanna, um, well, that was one incredible hour. Um, it was so inspiring to hear your journeys, how you got to where you are now and the obstacles you've had to overcome. And we know that there's still much to be done when it comes to gender equality and finance and investment. And just bringing attention to it, celebrating women like yourselves and hearing your stories, um, hopefully it will inspire many young women in the audience today. Um, on behalf of the CFA Ottawa Society, thank you so, so much to our panelists today for taking the time from your busy schedule today to be here and sharing your stories and wisdom. We really appreciate it. And thanks also to every one of you. We had a good attendance today and who tuned in today. Um, you've helped make this event success and we look forward to organizing more events like this in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.